We are uh, continue our sermon series on living on mission. Really, it goes with our desire with Christmas in July, being out in the community and uh, just loving people and really uh, sharing the hope of Christ that we have in Christ. And so that's where really our heart is. And so today, as uh, David shared, there's a lot of different people in the room this morning. And so just want to kind of take note of that. There are some that have maybe been invited by a guest that are here. And you're like, why Christmas? Why are we doing this? And and so we're glad you're here. And, and uh, you you know, there is, uh, uh, we're, we're, again, we're grateful that you've come. And so we want to hopefully there'll be some answers for you in this sermon as well. There are others that have come from across the country that are in this room that are uh, really want to live a life on mission and are, are have whatever reason or how God has led them to this point. You're in this room today and you're like, I want to live on mission. There are others that have come this summer, they've been here for two months, that have said, listen, we want to explore what does it look like to be on mission in Medford, Oregon. And so uh, God has given you opportunity to work alongside Living Hope Church and into the community and to pray and see what we're doing. There's others that have uh, lived here their entire life, that have uh, come, been a part of Living Hope Church, have come to know Christ, have grown into leadership and have and say, listen, I'm on mission with Living Hope Church and we want to be a part of this community. We want an outward focus and we want to reach our neighbors and our friends and our family. And so there's a lot of different people uh, in this room this morning. And the truth is we've all been empowered to reach out. We've all been empowered to reach out. Uh, and so uh, and so as we think about that, last week uh, Jordan did a great job of sharing how uh, we've been empowered to, uh, we've been empowered excuse me, an empowered life that was mandated uh, through Scripture. When the book of Acts, uh, Jesus, as he was uh, uh, really sending out his disciples, he, as he was, again, I just think of the imagery, as he's floating into heaven, right? Like he's saying, go and uh, preach the name of Jesus throughout all of, all of uh, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the earth. And so as he commissioned them, that's really the, the life on mission that we have. We've been mandated to go tell, to share what God has done in in and through our lives. And so today we're going to hopefully uh, be able to see how we can really empower or reach out. We've been empowered to reach out. And again, I think we know that, but sometimes we forget that, right? We forget that. And so a couple things that uh, come to mind. So to do that, uh, when I think of uh, reaching out, I believe it is seeing the need, serving compassionately, and sharing the gospel is a life on mission. So it's seeing a need, Serving compassionately and sharing the gospel is a life on mission. And that's what really Christmas in July is. We have uh, opportunity to be in the community to through soccer camps, through uh, through uh, work projects, through share, uh, through with our snow cones, just being out in the community. Uh, and then it also can be if you are from this area or even in your own life, you think of this isn't just in Medford, Oregon. You can serve the community by loving your neighbor, by being present at work. Like there's all kinds of ways that what you love to do or there's a place that you like to play. Again, if you see a need, serve compassionately and then share the hope of Christ. That is a life on mission. And so uh, one thing that I love about this is that we think about uh, seeing the need is the first thing, right? Like that's really the hardest part, I think, about being on mission. Because I don't know about you, I've seen lots of things that need to be done that I just kind of walk by. So I was thinking, like, what makes me not see the need, right? Like, what makes me, again, we would all agree there are a lot of opportunities to share, to, to, to connect with people, not only just in Medford, but in our own personal lives, right? There's people you know that you work with that need Jesus, and you're like, they need Jesus, right? <laughs> like, there's a desire. And there's people that you work with. There's people that you play with that, 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 you, uh, that, you have, uh, that you have life, do life together. And you're like, man, they need Jesus. And many times those opportunities to, uh, to help, to minister to them, to be a blessing to them, we see it and we're like, we freeze in those moments. I don't know about you, but at one point there was a, uh, uh, I often sometimes miss those opportunities. So a couple stories. First of all, one would, uh, was, uh, my wife had bought me a Lazy Boy uh, recliner. Again, uh, it was a really big recliner, and this was years ago. And she bought it for me, and she put it. She bought it way early before my birthday, and she had put it in one of the rooms in our house. And it was in our house for probably three months. And I walked by it. I, I, you know, I was in that room several times, and she had told other people that. They're like, has he found it? It's like, no. And it was like right there. Like, it should have been seen. 
I did not see it. And so uh, I think a lot of times we don't see it because we have some reasons why. We, we get busy, right? We, don't, we see there's opportunities all around us, and that's what you'll see this week. There are so many opportunities to minister to this community, but what keeps us from that is we, we do live busy lives. We, we do live busy lives. Like, we have a lot going on. I don't know about your calendar, but it's pretty packed full. And if I have five minutes, I shove something else into there that, you know, I just busy lives. And so I, I really just try to keep myself busy. And if I don't, if I have time, I have my, this, this, this thing that takes a lot of my time, right? And I don't know, it's amazing how you can spend four hours watching people mow lawns or watching whatever you watch, right? And just sit there. It's like time goes by, but it's somebody need, you know, you're just, we, we feel so busy. We find we have uh, 24-hour news cycles. We have all these things. We binge watch. I don't know about you, but have you been caught binge watching? You know, and so uh, one trick, here's a trick. Is so don't start the second, like, don't let them do the credits, right? Like, don't let it go. Just cut it off. If it's done, it's done because you'll go to the next episode and then you're in, hooked in again. So seeing the need is one reason why we don't see it is because we're busy. I think also we can uh, often, we just have no margin. We just have no margin. You know, we, we, we pack things full, and really, it's really with no intention or no, no really uh, purpose. We just shove things through our life that this crisis comes in, and many of us feel exhausted because we're a part of this whirlwind that the next day is just blown. Like, we're just not focused because we just have so much going on that we miss many, many opportunities to see the need. Uh, also, I think that uh, what happens to me a lot, too, is I get used to the problem. Right? We just kind of get used to it. So it's amazing when somebody comes to your house to visit, like you notice uh, I, our bathroom needs a little bit of touch up paint and stuff. And we had people over the other day. I was like, I'm looking at that saying, man, we need to fix that. <laughs> you know? But you know what? Every other day I see that hole in the wall and I'm like, oh, well, we'll get to it one day. Right? We just get used to what the, the status quo is. We get used to it. And we miss these opportunities. And so my heart is for us to see the need. And then I think probably the biggest one for me, and I don't know about you, I'll, just, I'll throw myself under the bus, and I believe a lot of problems. I, I see a need, and it's legit, and I'm like, somebody should do that. Somebody else. Man, why doesn't anybody see that? And I'm like, man, can anybody see this? You know, and so I feel like that, uh, you know, there's, there's some truth to where if I see the need, there's probably a responsibility for me to uh, do something about that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And so uh, I think a lot of times for church members, the people that are part of churches, we see a need and we're like, man, the pastor needs to know this. Like he has nothing to do. What does that guy do all day? I'm going to call the pastor up. Man, doesn't anybody care about people anymore? Like nobody cares. Greatest moment I've seen one time was this lady had uh, uh, someone needed their lawnmower and they, they called out the church or like, nobody in the church loves this person because they wouldn't mow their lawn. And I'm like, why don't you mow the lawn? <laughs> you know, why? I mean, maybe like maybe you saw that. Again, I don't deny that she might need her lawn mowed, but, but why is it my job to call other people to do jobs that I see? And for my, when you, as your parent, you tell your kids, if you see something needs to be done, you need to take action and do that. And I think as God's children, if God shows you something, I think there really needs to be an opportunity. If we're going to live a life on mission, which we've been mandated by Scripture to do, we're, we're, we're obligated to take the opportunities that God's given us, we have to take that action. So the Scripture gives us a great illustration in the book of Acts of where uh, Peter and John, disciples of Jesus who had been impacted by Jesus, who had, uh, John was identified as the one that Jesus loved, or that one, the, the beloved, the one that Jesus loved, and Peter had seen God's grace in his life over and over, and these disciples had followed Christ, and now Jesus was ascended in heaven, and they come across an opportunity with a need that they see, and so let's read this, let's kind of, let's step into this text here in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, which is about three o'clock, uh, and a man lame from birth was being carried. Now, how my mind goes there, when I think of a lame man, I just think a guy with a green shirt, it's just kind of weird, but no, he actually couldn't walk, okay? So he was not just lame, but he couldn't walk uh, and was being carried. So he'd been there for, so from birth being carried, whom they lay daily at the gate, the temple that is called the beautiful gate and ask alms for those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, and did as did John, and said, look at us. So guess what? He sees the need. 
He sees, this, he sees the need, and it says, uh, and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And so we see uh, Peter uh, take action. In verse 8, it says, And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at, at what had happened to him. And so what we see here is that Peter and James, like, so it says that he'd been at the temple for many, many times he'd been there. And so what we would understand is Jesus had walked past this man many times, right? And so as they, this one particular day, Jay, uh, John and Peter were walking by, and I think God gave them a vision or gave them clarity to see that particular need that day. And so they had an opportunity, and I don't know about you, when you have somewhere to go, the hardest thing for me to do is to stop when I have somewhere to go, right? Like, I don't want to be late. I just have, like, uh, we'll see somebody pulled off to the road. And I'm like, should we stop? It's like, nope, we don't need to stop. You know, that's just my, I don't like to stop. I don't, so I can be like, if a mechanic issue, I'd be like, yep, it looks like it's broke down. <laughs> that's my solution. <laughs> you know, I can't plumb it. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, so it's like, but anyway, there's, there's a part. But that would be, that's, so I think, what would stop me? I'd be busy. My, my schedule, there's no margin in my schedule. But at this moment, they locked eyes, they saw him, and they took the opportunity. So when you see the need, this is why I believe living on mission, our mission-driven life would be, is take the lead. Is to take the lead. So James and John see the need, and they take the lead. They, they take first personal responsibility, and they say, it, we go back to the text, it says they directed his eyes at them and fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something. And so he was re- ready to receive money. But what they saw, they saw more than just the issue that was before them. They saw a bigger issue. And really, God did a miracle in this moment. Like, God did more than they knew what they would do. I don't really think that Peter's like, I'm going to see this guy walk. I think he, just by faith, stepped into this moment, guy's life. And God did what God was going to do. And so what our, our opportunity is, when you see the need, take the lead. And so that goes in your family. When there's a need in your family, you know what? Take the lead. If you see it, I think there's an opportunity. It's amazing how many times we miss out on what God is doing in our lives. We're like, man, God's just not moving. I just don't feel like I'm on mission. I just don't feel like I'm doing anything for God. I believe God, if God could sit down and say, look, and you just had video reel of all the opportunities that were before you. And again, we like to reconnoitre these opportunities often, at least I do. And my kids are really good at, right, they'll walk past a dirty something on the floor. They'll just walk past it all the time. And just as my children are, so am I often. It's because the reason why, and we'll talk about it here in a moment, is there's some consequences for taking the lead. And this is a life, a mission. What this, is, this was, what this began to be is a roller coaster, a springboard action that, Jay, that Peter and John did not expect or maybe they did expect, but a lot took place after they saw the need and took the lead. And so what do they do? They, they uh, back to the point, is they, uh, they saw the need and then they begin to serve compassionately, right? It's easy to walk over somebody. It's difficult to stop and listen to what they really need. And that's really what Christian living is. That's what a life on mission is. There are people in your life right now, there are people that you know that are hurting deeply, and you have no idea that they're going. I bet you in this room alone, there are tragic moments that are going on in, every, in people's lives today that you're facing things that are surmountable to you. There are things that are going on, the worries and the cares and the hurt and the sorrow and the agony. This, this man for 40 years had been laid there every day, been laid there just like, and just begging for something, for, for anything. And so I'm telling you, there, the opportunities are all before us. But you know what? It takes us to stop to really see the need, but then also to, to serve compassionately. And that takes effort. It does take effort. It does take time. And so that's where uh, what I found in my own life is really beginning to put some margins in my life, putting some space in my life to, uh, you know, I really think we, we fool ourselves. And again, I'm speaking for myself in this way, but I fool myself to often think how busy I really am. You know, I, as I began to really work through my calendar, my time management and stuff, what, it's not only just getting, sick, like, busy things or things that you don't need to be doing, do, like, off your But once you start to realize 
like what you really do, you know, really what you spend your time doing is really convicting. And it can be very challenging. And a lot of times, but that, I believe that's where if God's people would really begin to think, what does it look to live on mission? I think it's really just looking around for those opportunities. Now, many of you have, have come this week to see that need. And we're going to have some opportunities this week with families and with, uh, with people that are coming to a soccer camp and, and some seniors that need some, some things. There are going to be some opportunities for us to really practice this and put it into our life. And so I think it's seeing the need and then serving compassionately. Man, I think just walking a little bit in other people's shoes helps me in this. A lot of times I can be critical or cynical about things, but just seeing what other people face and what others, having some little bit of empathy in those moments and recognize what it would be like to be that man sitting there desperate for something more. But then to have God step in in a way. You know what was amazing about this thing? It wasn't just that Peter and John saw this guy, but God saw him. And for 40 years, he suffered this way, but God's like, not today. I'm going to send somebody your way that's going to change your life. And that man, I mean, his life transformed. He comes into church. I know it's shocking to us. He came praising and, and leaping. Like, who comes to church praising and leaping? We don't, we don't allow that stuff at Living Hope Church. Like, hey, 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 we don't do that stuff. You go out, you celebrate that stuff somewhere else. We don't get excited about following God or serving God. We just keep it low-key, right? And so there's a, there's a desire. Here he was so excited and couldn't believe what happened that people around them began to question what happened. And this is what begins this, really, this trajectory where John and Peter begin to go and use all of these opportunities. So I think it's great that we do great things for the community. And I think it's amazing that we walk with people where they are, that we, we love people where they are. We, Living Hope Church, I think we've gotten good at that. We're getting better at that. I don't think we're where we want to be, but we always are getting better at walking people where they are. And so what we have to do is now connect that that, that, that service, that compassionately serving people, and really share what really changed their lives. Peter and John were changed because Jesus came into their life. And so this man, they, he begins to share. And then as everybody got attention, what did he do? He began, they began to share. If you read chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Acts, he, he shares the gospel multiple times. And so some consequences happen. And we love the positive consequences. We love that this man got saved and this man or got healed and was celebrating. And we were celebrating that. We all rejoiced in that. But man, Peter and John were arrested for this. They were accused. You know, you just do something nice for people. People will, will accuse you of all kinds of things. People will say things about you when you do the right thing, the right way, the nice way, with intentionality, with the right heart. You know, very often my motives are, are never right. And sometimes they're as close as they ever can be to being right. And that's when usually, man, I get, I get ripped up apart before not having the right motives. I, mean, I tried to do it the right way, right? No good deed goes unpunished is what they say. And it often feels that way. And so what we want to do is keep our mind on the prize. And the prize is that hope, really what those men and women needed, and the miracle was being done, and the service that they had done was to share what Jesus can do in their lives. And so always want to connect the service with the Savior. You want to connect the service with the Savior. Listen, I don't do good things because I'm a good guy. Well, I'll just be honest. I'm pretty selfish. And just ask my wife, right? Like, I'm pretty selfish. And so, and neither are you. You don't just do things. You're like, I'm so good. I'm just going to do things. What makes me do good things is my Savior has been good to me. Amen. And my Savior has loved me through really terrible moments in my life. And my Savior has died for me and gave me hope and purpose and meaning. And because of his goodness and because of his grace and because I was that beggar laying there waiting for something and he stepped into my life and changed and transformed me, now I have an opportunity to see the need and take the lead, right? And so uh, what, a, what a great life that we can live when we live a life on mission. And so... Peter and James go on, and so let me, we're going to step into back into the text on Acts 4, verse 8. They have been arrested, they've been threatened, they've been, uh, they have been released, and now here they're being interrogated for why they did what they did. Why did they do that? What, is, what are they doing? And so Peter responds, these rulers of the people and elders, if, it, if, he, if we are being examined today concerning the good deed done to a crippled man, what, what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to you all, to all of you, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that, that was rejected by you and the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in 
no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which must be saved. Verse 13 says, Now when you, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated common men. Amen, right? They were just normal people loving Jesus. And he says, And they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. What a joy. What a, what a great indictment about anybody. If someone said, Man, you know what, Sean? You're pretty annoying, but you, you, you sure do love this Jesus a lot. Like, that's pretty good. I'm glad I love you. Know, I'm, I'm thankful, right? That's a good thing. He says, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. What amazing thing. We do good things for nothing, and they're going to be like, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And we're like, we did it because we love Jesus and love you. And they're going to have nothing to say. They're gonna, even if they do say, it's like, what are they going to say? Oh, no, we help people that were hurting. We walk with people where they're at. We love them where they were. Like, that's a great indictment. And that, my friend, is a life, a mission. And so one thing that, that scares me with God's people often is we know that if we take that stand, it's going to direct us into a, a roller coaster of, of moments. So if I do something that I know God wants me to do, and I die to self, and I serve somebody, and I see the need, I, I serve with compassion, and I share the gospel, there's going to come some response. And some is going to be negative, and some is going to be positive. And so the question is, will I still do it if nobody loves it? Will I still do it? Do I, will I be brave enough and have the faith in Christ to know that I'm going to do it even if nobody recognizes it because he loved me enough? You know, how many divorces would never happen if husbands and wives would love each other like Christ loved them? How many conflicts would go away if we love people like Christ loved us, right? Like how, how many, all those things that we struggle with uh, instead of trying to be right or trying to get our way. And it really does come. And I've been really thinking through this. I was talking to uh, Jacob yesterday. And really one thing he said to me, uh, one thing about living a Christian life is really dying to yourself. Dying to yourself. You know what? If I see the need, I have to die to myself because I have to do something about it. If I take the lead, right? And then if I not only just do it. So we, we've I've often, and I've done things, and my kids have done things, and you have done things, that you see it and you do it, but you don't do it the best to your ability. You don't do it with compassion. You're like, here you go. <laughs> you, know, you know, you especially see it with your kids, right? Give so-and-so such and such, and they're like, there you go. <laughs> like, they just have no kindness to it. But, but really, if we serve with compassion and we connect the Savior to the service, I believe that's a life on mission. And I believe we all have been commissioned and been uh, uh, really been called to do this. And some of you have come a long way to, do, to be a part of it. And this, at Living Hope Church, we want to truly be a church that walks with people where they are. We're going to meet some hurting people, people that are far from God. And you know what? It reminds me where I was when Jesus met me. I was far from God, alone and isolated and, had, and was really hopeless. And thankfully, somebody saw a need to take uh, uh, two young people that were in a trailer park, picked us up and drove us to church when we were six and five years old and so god god there was a need and someone saw it and began to minister to me and there's been many many times where people have blessed my life and you know and that's what living on mission is you know we've been empowered to reach out and so my hope is that we leave here today with 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 a different vision that we have eyes to see and then we have faith and you know I can talk about the good things, but there was also one time when I had an opportunity. I was standing, there was a, a police officer that we had done some ministry work in the past, and I, hadn't, I was standing behind him in, in, in uh, uh, Starbucks, and I was like, I'm going to buy his coffee. And I just like, I like, just for a moment, I waited. You know that moment? You're like, you should buy his coffee, and I just waited. And before, before it was, I, I missed the opportunity. And you know, I always think back, like, man, I, just, I want to listen to the Spirit. And one thing I think to do that is we read in the book of Acts, always they're empowered by the Spirit. You know what we have to do? If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, we've got to be empty of ourselves. Right. We have to be empty of ourselves. And so we have to come to a place, and I think this is where a great opportunity. If we want to be, have, be empowered, and I want to be empowered to see the need, and I want to have the faith and the confidence to take the lead. I want, when my friend needs to have something, I want to be a person that's present, that's, that's pleasant, and that's prayerful. I want to be a person that's right, that we're willing to take action and not look to other people to do it. Now, if I have to get others to help me, I think that's great. I think that's what we're doing this week, right? We've seen some needs. We've seen some opportunities. And we have called some friends from all over the country to come help us reach out into this community and make, uh, make much of Jesus. And so, and so help me have the faith to do that and to connect the Savior to the service. And so my prayer for this morning is that we 
we not only know that we've been empowered, but we would recognize that empowerment and we would see the need and take the lead. So if our musicians come, uh, we're grateful for that. And so what a, what a joy to be able to serve the Lord together this week. And so uh, again, uh, I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to pray that maybe uh, as you have opportunity this week that you would step in that. And again, it doesn't have to be someone that you don't know. It could be someone that you work with. You pray, maybe you need to get on the phone this morning and be like, you know what? I love you. I just needed to tell you this. You know, just whatever you need to do to get right with the Lord. And we've been activated for the gospel. We have been, we are living a life on mission. And it goes beyond just a week of service. This goes really with a life service. And so let me pray for us this morning. God, we thank you so very, very much for your grace. I thank you for the example of Peter and John. I thank you for the faith that they took. Lord, look at the outcome of a man that has been changed, really excited about what God's doing. Lord, you, you know the future, and you know what's coming up this week. God, you know every one of us and all that we're going through. You know the struggles, the, the difficulties. You know all that we're facing. And God, that you have, uh, you have empowered us to reach out to people. There's so many hurting people in this country this morning. There's so many people hurting in this nation, in this, uh, in this community. There's people in our families and there's people in this church that are hurting. Help us to have eyes to see. Help us to really serve with compassion. We'd walk with people where they're at. That we'd love them. That Lord, we wouldn't try to use them as a project or just try to, to convert them. But God, that we would see your healing hand in a way that only you can. And that's, the way that's done is through us. You've activated everyone in this, in this morning, no matter where they are or where they're from. You have a purpose and a plan for them. You have something for them. You have more for them. And I pray you give us the faith, you give us the, the willingness, the obedience. And God, we'll just give you the praise for all of this. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Christmas in July. Thank you for the mission teams. And I thank you so much for you, Jesus. You deserve all the honor and praise. And we just ask this in your precious name. Amen.